It is the Anfield Wrap. It's Neil Atkinson with Stu Wright, Ian Ryan and Gareth Roberts. Stu and Ian were, and I'll put this in inverted commas, fortunate to be at the Stade de France on Saturday evening. We will be getting to matters pertaining to that. Uh, we will also discuss Sadio Mane. Uh, that is going to come up as well. Uh, we've got Gareth with us. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, we're going to start off. We will talk about the game in and of itself, first and foremost, before we get on to other matters arising from the weekend. Gareth, Liverpool, nil, Real Madrid, one. Champions League finalists, Liverpool finalists is a good thing, uh, but to lose in a final hurts. It's a blow. It's what happens when you don't take your chances and when you don't take your chances to create even better chances and that's what Liverpool are left to rue, I think. Yeah, and, and you're right. First and foremost, it did stink. It did hurt. I think um, we rightly went into it with confidence and I think the way the game started as well, you look, you're looking at it going, well, Liverpool are the better side here. Uh, Madrid have set up in a way that respects Liverpool being the better side as well. So now it's up to Liverpool to create the quality of chance that's going to win us the game. And unfortunately, there just wasn't enough of that. I mean, I know Courtois is obviously and rightly getting a lot of praise for his performance and, and his, you know, his save in particular for Mane, you know, is quality to be fair to him. But, you know, across the 90, Liverpool just don't, for me, create enough clear-cut chances. And, you know, there are, there are snatch chances. There are people... i seen a, a tweet this morning which, you know, in a gallows kind of way made me laugh in, in that it said, I've got PTSD off Naby Keita's shot. <laughs> <laughs> It was one of the great. It was one of the great shots of our time. Now, one of the great ridiculous attempts of our time. He's had a good season now, so but that was a belter up, up there with Dejan Lovren know, against Aston Villa. Lovren, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was and, and and look, it was sad, wasn't it? It was a sad way to end what has been an absolutely brilliant season. And that you know, I I, am, I immediately was you know on purpose doing the context thing with my mates trying to do it on post match pints as well because. I was like, we, we can't get away from the fact here. Let's not lose sight of the fact that this is the best version of Liverpool I've ever seen, you've ever seen. We're so privileged to have such a great team and a great side right now. And you know what? The the the, the parade really sort of cleansed the palace. It, it was absolutely brilliant, the parade, because there was a lot of talk in the, in the immediate aftermath, not just in, in the group of people I was with, but the people in general who were in the room, in the pub, of like, you know, that's going to be grim now and I might not go and all of this. And I was like, bollocks to this. It's like this city and this club and us as people, we're about being defiant. So let's go and be defiant tomorrow. We know these are boss. <laughs> They've lifted two fucking pieces of silverware this season. They didn't get to do this when they won the league. Let's go and show them what 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 they mean to us. And we did do that and it was brilliant. And I did, I, I went round Chilwell five ways and I've obviously seen the footage from elsewhere as well. And all of it is absolutely brilliant. And it's it's brilliant because, you know, you heard the players say as well things like, well, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. And like, you know, the footage from like Henderson, from yeah. Trent and all of that, and how made up they are. And, you know, Milner saying, what is it? I can't fucking believe what I'm seeing or something along those lines. Like, so we've we've made our statement to the team. We've said thank you to them. And that's absolutely <coughs> super. That's a trophy in itself. Well, it's it's one in getting... The defeat and the kick and the, the the pain of it all, and then everything that's gone on outside and around the ground as well, to turn that into, it's still party time in this city. It's still this is what you've done for us over the course of the campaign. To me, this sort of it's the sort of game you know looking back on it and almost in the context of that where I just wish there was a second leg. I wish there was another go round at this, and obviously there isn't. It is a final, and when the goalkeeper throws in that performance and Liverpool don't quite create the chances, you then do need the lift, as Gareth says, to remind yourself. These have been absolutely incredible because they were just, and they, they come up really close, I think, in this final towards being genuinely incredible, towards genuinely sweeping the, taking the game away from Real Madrid. But when they don't take the game away from Real Madrid, they open the door for the idea that Real Madrid can just take the moment away from them. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a strange game to, to analyse, to be honest, because on the one hand, I think you could sit here and say, Liverpool did enough to win the game. Mm. Of course, was man of the match. So... By the very definition, Liverpool have done enough to win that game of football. But my my thought watching it and coming out of the ground was we probably could and should have done more. Um, and I can't really get away from that thought, to be honest, despite those chances and despite those saves that he pulls off. And if you look at the stats, again, make a case that Liverpool were, were definitely the better team. And I certainly felt that in the ground first half. And if you'd have asked me at half time how this was going to go, I said, well, yeah, apart from maybe a two or three minute spell, <clears throat> Liverpool have dominated. I'm probably going to take this away from them because I think as the game wears on, 
they'll become maybe a little bit more tired and we'll be able to take advantage of maybe one or two gaps. But it, it doesn't materialise that way. And um, they use all their nows. And I think once they get that one goal ahead, it was such a blow because all of a sudden then I thought, I'm not sure, you know. I don't know if we're going to have enough to come back into this. I was at half-time. I went from sort of on about 30 thinking, there's every chance Liverpool streak away with this, Ian. At half-time, I thought, this is going to be a one-goal game, this. And it, when, when I say that, what I mean is I thought it was going to be first goal, the winner. I yeah. thought there was a chance if someone got one, they'd go on and get two. But I thought it was going to be uh, it was going to be first goal, the winner. And that that shift, <clears> I thought, when it was about who was the better team, which is what I thought it was going to be on about 25. And then when it became first goal, the winner, I was just... Yeah. This is now this now does feel 50-50, uh, which it didn't do it didn't do 15 minutes ago. But I think in amongst all of that, there's a lot of security in the game for Liverpool until the 42nd minute and the yeah. disallowed goal. And then I don't think Liverpool are right again until after Real Madrid score. And then I actually think Liverpool are all right. In the, they're not brilliant, don't get me wrong, but they're all right in the period of meet. It was like it was almost like after the after the disallowed goal, Liverpool almost needed the worst to happen for them to right themselves. And that that to me is almost the most disappointing part, more so than than, than other aspects. Yeah, it, it it was a strange one, um, and I've seen people debate the disallowed goal um, and say maybe it should have stood. Um, I've not really watched loads of it back, and I don't really plan to watch loads of it back, to be honest. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, some of the saves that Courtois makes, I mean, the Mane one is ridiculous, as Robbo said, because that just looked like a goal all day. I think the Jota one, where it ricochets, when he's gone the other way for Salah, I think that's an incredible he's save. It in. yeah. He gets back down yeah. the other way. I think it's an incredible see, save. I did see it. I think that got replayed on the stadium. It, it didn't look like it was travelling at enough pace for me. And I take the point, maybe the goalie could have gone a little bit you know, sooner, and that makes it even more of an issue for him. But I just don't think he was enough pace on it. It almost kind of, it allows him to fall back on it. I think the Salah one, where he pulls it out the sky, which is incredible skill from Salah, that's an unbelievable save. Yeah. I think he gets it with his with his forearm or the top of his arm, something like that. That was the and, moment. And, and, that wasn't. It? And you that were like, this felt is like, scoring. And, and I think they felt like it was the moment as well because yeah. they surround a goalkeeper, and it was a it was a huge moment. And then there's the one where Salah gets at the back post. I think Joss has headed it back, and of course, I've done very well to scramble across, and and he he, he takes the he takes the ball away from um from the goal there with I think his leg. So, I mean, there's two or three outstanding saves, but I think you're right, Neil. It never felt. Right for Liverpool in that maybe fifteen minute period after half time and just before half time and and Real Madrid, you know they do what a what a really good European team should do. They use all the tricks in the book. They take a minute or two when they need to. Any sting comes out of the game and they've got the subs. And I think they end up making about three, but it felt like five. Um, yeah. It just felt like they were able to kill time as and when, and that just takes any momentum out of Liverpool's game. What surprised me looking back at aspects of the game, Stu, looking at the stats of the game is. And this is where I'm very into the idea of firstly the goalkeeper's excellent and secondly the Real Madrid players in conjunction with the manager are very good at killing moments within the match. But it's remarkable how much ball we actually have in the Real Madrid penalty area. Not in the final third, but in the penalty area. We keep Firmino, repeated occasions, gets into their box with space and I'd say a little bit of time. You know, I'm not... This isn't me damning Real Madrid with faint praise. They're worthy champions and it's been a hell of a run for them all the way through. And I want to be really clear about that. This is I'm not bitter about the, the, the outcome of the football match at all. But... That's not a great tactical plan if people are repeatedly getting into the into your penalty area, you know. And Liverpool did manage to do that, and that's that's the frustration. You you, you can't ask for more than working the ball into the box over and over again. Yeah, we did. I thought a lot about this actually because we did have so much of the ball in the final third, and we showed up to a point, um, you know, great patience and composure. But I never felt it around their box when we were in those situations where there was that um, where there was that. That pressure that was being retained and maintained there, I never felt we were explosive around the, the box. It goes back to what Gareth said before around um, there wasn't enough clear cut chances that we made. It was around, every chance that we made w- w- was graft. It was graft, and someone uh, that's a work a little bit of magic like Mane's one in the, in the first half. The ones that that were a little bit more clear cut, like the Salah one we said there, where where he was where he brought it down incredibly, and Courtois makes that save. That was a bit more direct. And the, the, when we spoke on the, the the post-match show, my head was everywhere and I couldn't really organise my thoughts, but I've had a little bit of a think afterwards about what I meant on that. When I was talking about Liverpool's evolution into a, a really composed team, Klopp always talks about how we, we attack with, with protection and there's there's, a, there's a, a thoughtfulness that goes in behind all the moves that we make, never leaving ourselves exposed and... Listen, that's brilliant. That's helped us become one of the, or the certainly one of, if not the most dominant force in European football over the the, the last two or three years. But when I think back to um, 
the first incarnation of this Klopp's team, it was all about dynamism, explosiveness and embracing the chaos. And now we've gone the other way, which is the right thing to do as you become a more experienced um, and intelligent dominant football team. That was the right thing to do. We have a more controlled approach to our football. But I still think there's a, there's a place and time for in games being able to flick that switch. And I think that's what that's the hardest trick here to pull off. That's the hardest thing to do in game. Be able to go right. Let's bring the chaos now for ten. Let's bring. Let's absolutely bring this to chaos. I think Man City are better at that than us. I think that um, they have an incredibly inc- controlled way of playing football as well. But you get a sense with Man City that they can overload team for ten and absolutely destroy them. We see it a lot at the start of games where they'll just just blow a team away. Which it's the reason why we felt when if they scored one against Villa, they'd score three. We have that overriding sense of they know how to overload yeah. and completely blow a team away on the flick of a switch. Now, it's very, very hard to mentally control when you can conflict that switch. Otherwise, City would have done it at any point during that Villa game. Do you know what I mean? They needed that little bit of luck. They needed that little bit of a kick. And then they, and they had it. And I think that's the, the the true next step for this Liverpool team if they can do it. Because I'm not sure any team has ever been able to do that. Go from a team in-game who is all about controlled football, all about that dominance, but at the, you know, the, the flick of a switch, embrace their chaos. And in that game then, when we were around their penalty area... It would have been lovely to have to have had that sense of you know, when we remember the Dortmund game at, at Anfield when their their defenders just didn't know what to do with themselves. They're talking to each other, trying to trying to calm each other down. How can we stop this? That they're getting it, get hold of each other. And it would have been nice to have put that Madrid defense under that kind of pressure. And I, I don't think at any point we did. Yeah, um, I don't know what else to add. Really, like I've. I've I've thought about it on the post match points, obviously, and then I was like, right, I'm done. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I know I'm on here, and, and, and so you, you've got to keep on going. But my thing with it as well, I think, was that we had all the ball, we had all the shots, and as Ian said before, you know, you can look at it and make a big case for Liverpool should have won this. And Jürgen talked about that afterwards, saying, you know, there's something wrong if their goalie's man of the match and all this kind of thing. But as I said before, I think I, I've got a begrudging respect in a way for what Madrid did. I'm 100 percent with you on that because what I think they've done, and what, you know, the manager is obviously experienced, has got an unbelievable record in this competition. They've looked at it and gone, "We can't go toe to toe. We don't want a game. We don't want basketball. We don't want a, pro- a proper football game. We sit in and we look for a moment, as you said before. We look for a moment and we take that moment. And they've done that over and over again in this run. And that <clears throat> you've got to say is to their credit, absolutely. And and I thought they actually defended a lot better than I thought they were capable of. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you saw them concede four against City, three against Chelsea, and I really fancied our chances. Now, I think it was a little bit of a combination of they they upped their level in, in terms of how well they defended. They were impressive, I thought, defensively. But also, our front three, although they had moments, and Mane at the post, um, Mo. Um, I think has six attempts on goal, but there's probably only really like even the one he kills. I think the keeper saved it. It's got that expect. I expect got it. Got it the big two are the one where he brings it down out the sky, yeah. and then the other one where he's at the back post as discussed yeah. before. They're the big two, but they're two great chances. One of the things I think, Gareth, and I'm with you 100 percent on the fact that they did defend better than I expected. Thought Caraval played better than I expected. To be fair to mm. him, but the the flip side of this is, and this is the tightrope. And listen, they walked it. I do think if Liverpool do score one. At any phase of the game, really, they will go on and score two or three. And would you? Even even at one nil, even you know at one nil when we were beginning to really pile on bits of pressure, I was thinking if this just goes one here, Liverpool will run all over these and go and get a second really, really quickly. Yeah. And I think that became their gamble as the game was wearing on. And in the first half, when we were bang on top, I was thinking, you know, if the man a one, it could hit his back and go in. It's a great save, but it could hit his back yeah, and, yeah, go yeah, and yeah. bounce back in. And if that hit his back and bounce back in, then I think that they're going in half time two or three down. There's and, loads. Of, there's loads of what ifs, isn't there? And, and they're always is in these situations and it's hard to take and all that even all the you know the targeting of Trent in terms of you know he's he's at the scene of the crime for Vinicius Junior's goal and everyone's you know gone back to the lazy narrative of he can't defend and he's this that and the other um I actually totally disagree with one of the analysis pieces I read on the on the athletic when it was someone who's like high up in football I can't remember what his position was I think he'd worked in Germany or whatever but he was going on about Trent doesn't look Trent does look I've seen him look. I've watched it back as well, and he does look. What he doesn't do is react to looking, and I, and only he can tell you why he doesn't. But he, he does look, and he does know Vinicius Jr. is there, 
and then he doesn't adjust his position accordingly. He doesn't drop back. He doesn't change his body shape. He just sort of stays where he is. I think he's backing on. I'm catching him offside. Yeah. Um, and, and he's not looking to defend it in the traditional way a fullback defends that that position. He's going to hold the line and catch him offside, and he nearly does, but he doesn't. And it's in the back of the net. I, I agree with, with all of that about if we score one, if any of those goes in, we have that little bit of luck, then I think we, we probably take the game away from them. But I, I think, you know, my, my point is there that we're going to face, and we've seen it already, we're going to face an increasing number of teams who are going to play this way against us. We're going to play deep and try and kill a space and what have you. And listen, eight out of ten times, it won't work. We'll have enough. But now and again, it will work. And actually, the margins are so, so fine now between us and City and and, he, and obviously in the Champions League in a final like that as well. The margins are so fine that we've got to find a way to overcome that and actually mitigate that risk of, of that two out of ten times a team being able to, 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 to stunt us in the final third. And, and I think that's... I think that's no that's no bad thing. I, I think that's just the next step. I think that's the next evolution of this uh, of this Liverpool team. And this Liverpool team now is evolving. I mean, we are in the middle of... It's great. That we listen, we, we've, we've nearly won four trophies there. We've won two of them. And we're, we are in the middle of a transition period. You could, it's happening before our eyes. It was happening last season. It's happening this season. It'll happen going into next. There is a slow, quiet, really methodical evolution of that, that football team going on. We're going to talk about Marnie a little bit later on. Um, and, and I think that's just something that we've seen Klopp embrace every little... Um, New age technology in in his armor, he can he can possibly add, and I think that 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 might well be something it, it, this this Liverpool team thinks about next how they can overcome not just eight out of time, eight out of ten times, but nine nine and a half, ten out of ten times. Well, they've been doing that, that as well. I mean, that's why we got Thiago, isn't it? That, you know, Thiago yeah, was, was adding that. You know, Diaz as well. I mean, like, I didn't think Diaz had his greatest game for us there. Thought Thiago tired massively as well. Mm, he did half. as well, yeah. And obviously, but, there was the touch and go thing about whether he was even starting. Yeah. So you know, there was obviously an issue there. Um, and, and I just, you know, one or two like that, that the real top players that are on our side were just not 100%. And, and look, after 63 games mm. where 59 times they've avoided defeat, it's really hard to get stuck into them. I think they were goosed as well. You've yeah, got to throw yeah. that in there. Yeah, yeah. And even though they had the days off and all that, and they had a bit of time to prep for this, I think, you know, the relentless football they've played, the way they play football, the way they break sides down, told a little bit yeah. as well. Uh, especially second half and then you know the changes for me didn't influence it massively how you, how you would want and you know I I was I, I just was dream, dreaming for a Bobby moment again do you know what I mean I just thought it was on you know what I mean I was he like he the shot when he gets like, in yes, he Bobby should, yeah he should have had the shot there know. you know he really should have just put that onto his right foot and just so you see if he could bend it I, I think I mean I think there's loads of things at play yeah. and I think tiredness and the amount of games of course it it has to be a factor because to go and be that relentless for 60 odd games will always take its toll on teams. There's no doubt about it. But I think you, know, you have also got to have respect for the opposition. And Ancelotti had already put three of these pots in his own trophy cabinet before. So he's not turning up like any fucking mug. He knows how to set a team up. And he can talk about games against Chelsea and City and PSG. <coughs> They're two legged ties. They're very different than a one off game in 90. And I think, you know, we talk about Diaz maybe not performing. They had a plan for Diaz. They had a plan for him. Um, and I thought he marshaled them pretty much, probably as well as anyone's done so far since we've seen him kind of arrive um, and start to perform in a Liverpool shirt. And he's been brilliant, by the way. So, you know, it, it's nothing against him in this one-off game. It, it can happen. And I think, you know, they were they were every inch as smart as their manager, I thought, across across the game. And yes, Liverpool do get in now and again, but it is, it is long shots or it is a piece of skill. I mean... The, the, the thing that Salah does, he brings it out the sky. I mean, most normal Unbelievable. footballers, that, 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 that's bouncing off you and running away. You're not even getting a shot off. So it's only because he's such a genius in that moment that it allows him to take that ball and then force the save. So I think it's it's difficult. I don't know what you saying about the chaos thing, but I've never really looked at City and thought they were a team that could bring chaos. I just think, you know, that the analogy that gets used by City or by people when they, they critique, critique City is, is that, you know, it's a death by a thousand cuts. I think they kind of wear you down. I think it's also hard to bring chaos if you're not in your own stadium. I think Liverpool are still capable of doing that, but I think you need the crowd to feed into that and the players feed up the crowd and all that. It was a weird atmosphere and I know we'll come yeah, on to it a little bit later on, but it was it was a strange atmosphere and I was someone who was in the ground really, really early and didn't go through, certainly before the game, what certain people went through. Um, but you could tell. You could tell from where I was sitting. It wasn't right. The crowd wasn't right um, for obvious reasons 
and that's that's going to have an impact. I think it didn't feel like a European Cup final. It felt extremely odd. One of the strangest atmospheres I've ever been involved in, and I've been to lots and lots of football matches. So I think it's hard to then flick that switch. I think it's hard generally if Jürgen's sitting here now. That that that's almost a bit of a mixed message at time to, to to his team because they've evolved from being chaotic and they've become this controlled machine where they've lost four in sixty three. They've lost four in 63, so there's not a lot wrong. And yes, you can say they've been pipped at the very end, and that's what's hard to take. Liverpool have had a great season, but obviously it's not quite the season we all want because the two big pots that Liverpool, the manager, these players will have their eyes on and set the sights on before the start of the season. We've just, we've just ever so slightly fallen short. That's hard to take. There's not loads wrong here. It's four games in 63. The manager, he will stick to his principles. I don't think anything will change in terms of in terms of the, the fundamentals of what he wants to do and what he wants his Liverpool team to be. Um, yes, maybe it'd be one or two additions. And I think there's certain areas of the park where you can look and go, yeah, they probably need a little bit more in midfield, for instance, maybe one or two more options. But let's have it right. They've been they've been phenomenal from start to finish. And yes, it wasn't quite enough to lift one of those two big ones. But when you're going on all fronts, my God, it's hard to do that. Canate plays very well. Stu, were you surprised by his selection? Or did you, did you expect him to start? And I think the quality of his performance was was excellent, to be honest. Yeah, I, th- I think a lot of us said it, didn't we? That uh, if he'd have gone back 10 days, people were saying he was he was nailed on. I think the Wolves' performance put a little doubt in people's mind. I, I felt that, you know... He was a little bit scapegoated there because he was he was on the wrong side. He didn't have he didn't have the big man alongside him either, and he was young lads and he was playing against like a rejuvenated like I, I couldn't believe um, what's his name. Um, Jesus Christ, his name is Jimenez. There we go. Yeah, yeah. He, I, he, I know it does feel like it was about four years ago. <laughs> <don't worry>. It <laughs> does, um, but yes, yeah, so well, I think I think it was probably a little bit harsh. And, and when the team was named. I was like, yeah, no, I, I, you can actually absolutely see why it's 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 probably the sensible move in, in regards to um, counteracting Vinicius' pace. And, and I thought he was Liverpool's best player. Mm, I, I thought yeah, he was it yeah. was an imperious performance from Canate. Um, he, he never gave Vinicius a sniff um, down that side. He, he, he was brilliant. Um, I don't think many players. I don't think many Liverpool players you'd say came out with nine out of ten performances in nope. the game. I don't think many were three out of tens either. Um, that's one of the ways, that's one of the ways the game is actually really frustrating. There's a lot of six and a half sevens on show, and I feel the same for them as yeah. well. I hasten to add, and that is another reason why you sort of you you know you you are left a little like you know by all means in a really weird way. Give me a Benzema masterclass <laughs> and let me go. My God, he is scary, and he does this, this, and this to you. That never quite never quite sort of hits comes to full fruition. I thought Modric did a great job for his team, but there wasn't sort of a Modric moment or two in there where he where he took your breath away, you know that that's the really funny thing about the game is that I, I sort of came away from it going I would probably just give everyone seven apart from maybe the lad who scores the winner obviously uh, their, their goalkeeper their, their nous was impressive once they got one nil up I thought as yeah. much yeah. as hard as that is yeah. to say yeah. yeah but you know the way like they, they were moving the ball around getting to a certain position on the park and then just going back but again the, but the thing about like, what I, but little the, bastards but I think what I find <laughs> out about that Robbo is I think if we'd have gone one nil up people would have said, so all the way through this if we actually go one nil up around the time they go 1-0 up we and would then, have done the same I think we'd have done the same and yeah. then everyone would have said the now of this Liverpool team they came yeah. up against that Real Madrid team and they showed those wily old dogs a trick or two that, and that's what I find really frustrating with the sort of the, the post-match discussion around it is that the very thing that we mm. end up praising them for I think we would have praised ourselves for and Absolutely. it is simply about when the goal goes in yeah. and who scores it it was, it was, it was a nothing it was, you know, in many sense I, I was sat in there thinking it just feels like a nothing game for so much of the game apart from the odd moments that, that we, were, we were able to graft and you know, listen, I've listened to Ian's incredible speech there, by the way. <laughs> incredible speech. And, and and actually put me right on a few things because we're we're all we're all very still emotional after the game. But at the at the end of the day, yeah, this is this is the greatest Liverpool team, certainly of my lifetime and and arguably ever. Um and they were, they played against a very, very wily, smart Real Madrid team. But you know, at the ultimately every team, no matter where you are, no matter how good you are. You've got to be thinking about the next steps. You've got to be thinking about mm, oh, growth. Yeah. It's got to think about the next evolution. Otherwise, people go past you. You stand still. And it simply comes down to, to this. This is an incredible Liverpool football team. We've been in three finals and not scored a goal. That's the frustration. We've been in three finals That's and not scored a goal. That's massive. Though. And so, you know, and we've been pipped, pipped by the smallest of margins in the league. So the margins are so wafer thin. 
So you, you've got to be thinking, well, what's next? What do we do next? We are seeing an evolution of this team. We are seeing a transition period. Where there's going to be questions now about what happens around the front three. Inevitably, his contracts are starting to run out. And part of that process has got to be about doing things that, that actually... I'm not sure any team has been able to do before, like I said, you know, about being able to flick a switch, even when in a neutral ground, actually having that level of control. And it's not, chaos is probably the wrong word, but it's around having the confidence in the overload. There's no point in setting up a team and buying players who've got ridiculous pace at the back if you're still going to actually never take that chance to completely overload when you desperately need to. And it's, there's, a, there's another way of looking at it. You can go 4 to 4 which is what we did towards the end. There was a move from the bench there to take a midfield out of the equation and put another man forward. But you can also do that within the, within the game, within the moments, without necessarily having to wait to, to, to bring on the extra striker. And it's it's in that sense of desire, that sense of this has got to be the moment. You know, we've got to throw everything at this. Without having to resort to putting Van Dijk up front uh, at the end, there's got to be another another way to try and answer the question that we're going to be posed time and time and time no, again. It's not going to be teams. the Chris Wood chat again, this is it? <laughs> no, Absolutely. I hope not. But it's got, there's got well, to we be... We did Mr Big Man. There's got to be an, a, a, another yeah. thing that we, yeah. we can do, another option that we are well prepared for, even if it's a signal from a bench of 10, mo- 10 oh, minutes of madness. madness. My, there's got to be something. My instinct my instinct on that and around that is, is it's interesting when we to go back to the very start of the season uh, when Elliot is selected repeatedly so I think it's the idea of the eight who can genuinely become tens yeah. for a period if you need yeah. to and I think that was what the manager was trying to do with yeah. Elliot and I think that that is the next sort of that is the next phase I and think. I think he's thinking of it no, I yeah, do, yeah, I, I, and, and I think that's that. that's the commentary here isn't it and that's the frustration the margins are so thin okay how do you improve this Liverpool team how do you improve the greatest Liverpool team arguably of all time but you've got to try I think that's fair and I think that's where when I allude to additions and you know, I'm not going to turn this into a transfer show or anything but, but, but I think he will, he will be looking at that midfield area and thinking couldn't I have to do with a lad in there you know who maybe just chips in with, with a few more from open play and I know you can throw stats out about you know certain players have got six and seven this season you know, a lot of them will be penalties and stuff but I'm not having to go for Vino by the way because that's not his job but I think but I think there will be an element of thinking well can we just get a lad in there who may be Supplements what we've already got in the forward areas, and he's able to chip in with more goals because I think that's something City have got. <clears throat> Stuart, I know they've got mm. you know this thing around him not playing with a centre forward, but but hey, Jesus is a centre forward, and they've got lots of lads who can operate through the middle and stuff. Albeit they're not kind of you know pinned as a number nine or anything, but they have got lads from midfield who can. Who I think can, when it's have, tight, I think they've got an eye on one, haven't they, in the post for well, the season after well, the next playing in Germany at the moment. Well, so, yeah, you know, but, but, but possibly so, and I think that's where the team can look at it and go, you know what. There's lads in there who are all good footballers and they all had a, a great deal in terms of, you know, keeping the ball taken over, facilitating all that, breaking up play, all that. But you couldn't have to do with someone in there yeah. every now and again who can just chip in with about eight, nine, ten goals a season. OK. Uh, any other business on the game that anyone's absolutely desperate to throw out? It's all right if not. Nope. OK. No. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I'd say, Neil, on the game is it because it was such a strange... Strange football match and a strange atmosphere, both pre and post match. I think most people have taken the defeat particularly okay because it just did feel like such an, an odd fixture. Um, and I think it ceased to feel like a priority. Yeah, is yeah. one of my things. Think, being in the ground at the moment when it kicks off, when there's still not people around me, and I know yeah. who should sort of be around me. Yeah, it ceased to be a bit of a priority uh, in a in, in a weird way and. You know, you do wonder about some of the reports that the players were clearly hearing because Robertson mm. knows enough post match to say this. Yeah, he does. Um, okay. Uh, uh, my other thing, my thing about why it doesn't sting as much now. Um, I said before that the, the parade was a bit of a, 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 you know, cleansed the palate, made you feel better, lifted everyone again, made you realise you're following a, a great club, a great club, and a great team. But I think as well that in the past we've been massively uh, boom and bust club basically and you know we've ended up changing managers or we haven't been able to replace players and all of this and I just think now we are a superbly managed club <coughs> yeah. from top to bottom and I, I've I've every faith that you know like I'm seeing daft pieces and it's always some of the same fellas and I shouldn't let it in but it, it creeps in anyway and I see it and it pops up on my social media and things like that so someone put it to me on, on you know I did off the ball uh, on Friday and it got put to me that Martin Samuel had said 
that you know uh, this could be the end of this group of, of players, their last hurrah and all this kind of thing. I've seen a headline before, and I think he's sort of followed up with you know a similar line, basically like you know he could end up being underachievers and all this kind of stuff. Like so, okay, if it's not written down in a history book, that old chestnut. But you know, not to harp on about them, but the situation we have got with Man City, their money, and all the rest of it, you've got to t- you've got to sort of use that context as context to say, well, if we weren't there, the whole thing would be boring as fuck. And we're keeping them honest. We've been brilliant, and we'll keep on being brilliant. And we we keep finding ways like tunnels to success, and we can't do it the way they do. So, you know, it, they go out, they're going out and they get they're spending top whack on a new striker, and he's going to be there next, you know, next season and all the rest of it. What are we going to do to react? Well, we're going to come on to talk about that. But what we're going to have to do is be clever and do something different and find a young player that wants to play for Jurgen Klopp, who can eventually be that player that they've just gone and bought from the you know the top shelf for top money. That's dead hard. But I back the group that we've got running the club yeah. to do it. Yeah. And I just think I just think Jürgen's an absolute genius as well. Like I just love to work for that fella. Imagine seeing him every day and him being your boss. He's unbelievable as a man and as a manager. He says all the right things all the time. You know, he was brilliant on the parade. The stuff he come out with about the city, the players, the group. He's had them partying again as well, even though they've lost the European Cup final. Like he did when they lost the UEFA Cup final. He's had them partying. He's got he's put smiles back on the faces already. And you're not telling me that come August when we go again, that they aren't coming out the blocks and blowing everyone away and challenging again for all of these things. That's why it's things left. Because it's not he's spot on. We're not gonna go and buy Balotelli this summer. No. We're not gonna fall off a cliff. <laughs> we're not gonna get Tonk six the, one by Stoke. I, I, I was thinking about this, Robo. I think that the manager's massive in that. And it it can sound a little bit a little bit corny, a little bit cliche when you say the manager takes the sting out of the feet, but I genuinely think he does. He does. By the words he uses and the language he chooses to use, it does take the sting out of it. And he is a genius for being able to do that. I don't think I've ever known another figurehead at a club, certainly at Liverpool in my time, where you're able just to click your fingers and it, it suddenly feels like it's, it's going to be all right, you know. It's, it's actually going to be okay because look at this group of players, look where we've come since, since 2015. Look at the finals we've been in. Look how far we've pushed this City team who are doing it in a very, very different way. He is an absolute genius at what he does. And I think, you know, if you were a player in and amongst that, how can you not feed off that? How can you not look at what went on yesterday as a maybe a potential player from afar and think, I want a fucking piece of that? You know the, you know the stuff as well that the weirdos say who look in on our world and they say, ah, the cultish them. And like, and like, look, there is, there is an element of it. I can see if you're them, why we annoy them. And I fucking like that. Um, and and Jürgen plays his part in that. So he'll say it's a special city, it's the best city, it's the best club. And we'll repeat that and we love that, he says it, and we love being part of it. And the scenes yesterday are amazing. And they pissed all over City Parade. Of, co- of course it did, because we do do it better. And this annoys people. They're like, well, why? what's this exceptionalism, bollocks? Why have you got to tell everyone that? Well, because we have. But, because but, but, that is our cult and we love our cult. And that's why our club is this good and our team is this good. And that's why Jürgen came here. Because he was like, yeah. I can embrace that power and that character and that that trait, if you like, and I can yeah. use it our, as a power. Our exceptionalism is because we are exceptional. Exactly. Yeah. But, 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 but some of the language that other fans will use to say... Liverpool don't take the domestic cup seriously. And then yesterday it was, I can't believe you're celebrating the domestic cups. Well, make your fucking mind up, lads. And also, Which one also, is it? Also, you can only win three trophies. <laughs> before, and it, most most teams in this country can only win three trophies. We've won two of them. <laughs> what the fuck do you want? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there, is, there is the big two, and we'll get back to it. Uh, next Last season, Liverpool ended the last 19, played, played 19, won 16, drew, drawn three. Uh, that's what the table will look like after 19 games next season. The pre and post game then... Got to be careful uh, for a number of reasons. Not because I care what anybody says uh, in the long run around the corner, more just stating things in the proper context and the order of this. So, Stu, you were present. You were tear gassed. Um, ultimately, the first responsibility for keeping people safe at the UEFA Champions League final falls to UEFA. 
And I think that the, the, the first step on this before we, we talk about the police, before we talk about the reporting in the immediate aftermath, although that is a major thing here, is that UEFA, this event was absolutely dreadfully organised. And the first thing UEFA tried to do when it was transparent how dreadfully organised it was, was blame Liverpool supporters. And for that, for me, there is no comeback. Uh, there's no comeback whatsoever. It's their responsibility first and foremost. It's why I don't want them to run any investigation because I don't believe you can't trust them for a second. You can't believe they'll act in good faith at this point because at the moment when it really mattered, they showed themselves to be A, incompetent and B, absolutely full of bad faith. The liars. The, the liars. It was my, you know, in the ground, it was my first reaction when I see that message come over the screen. They are lying to you. Um I'm quite upset about it, to be honest with you. I mean, That's I, 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 um, I didn't get the worst of it. I was, I was in a, in a neutral area of the ground. So me and one of the, the other lads, I mean, we stuck together like glue as we were trying to get into that ground and afterwards um, because it was frightening, it was dangerous. But a, a lot of our friends who were trying to get in <laughs> in a perfectly acceptable manner um, at the Liverpool end, what they were copping for before the game was just horrendous. I mean, my own experience of walking, we walked to the ground, we didn't get the metro, we, we, we walked from a drop-off point about 45 minutes away. And we walked to, through building sites, through, across dirt tracks, pinned in by, by fences. You didn't know where you were going, the signage was non-existent. You eventually get to the, to the near the stadium, and you're faced with an unbelievable high presence of police who are either armed with um, semi-automatics or with riot gear. Um, they've penned thousands of Liverpool fans in, in under a uh, un, underpass. Nobody knows why. No one's telling you why. No one's telling you why. There's no signage. You're asking questions of anyone, police included, and all you met with is a wall of silence and aggression um, and threats, baton wielding threats. You don't know whether you're with fans who are trying to get in the stadium or actually just fans who are present who just wanted to be around the spectacle. You have no clue if where you're stood is actually a pathway or a queue to try and get into the ground because you're still quite a long way from it. Um, you can't. You're in an underpass. This you're in an underpass. Think, you can't see anything. You're in an underpass. So yeah. That's that to me. You can't. You, you, you know the ground sort of there, but you can't see yeah. anything. So you, your only choice is either to wait or to just try and break ranks and just try and find any kind of sense of signage or communication anywhere, which is what we did. Um, so we we managed to find our way, and then you're just walking around the perimeters, lost around the stadium, which was, to be quite honest, a maze. Um, again, no signage. No communication. Um, it was it, it was so frustrating. Um, it was so surprising. It was, and then I mean to be fair, as I said, there are but there are better there are better place people who can talk about their experience before the game outside the Liverpool end. Uh, we managed to find our way into the stadium eventually after several calls. Where hardly anyone, by the way, I mean check ticket. No, you know that just that just didn't happen. Um, and then, <clears throat> but at the, I mean, the real the thing for me I couldn't get over is after the game, we just just want to get home, just want to get out out of the stadium, just want to get off the complex, and they wouldn't let you out. So every exit was blocked off by riot police, a wall of riot police. Again, not speaking to you, thousands of Liverpool fans just trying to walk down the steps to get out of the complex. We just want to go home. Um, so you you give up there, you, you you move on to the next one and the next one because it's it's just a bowl complex, and then you end up getting tear gas just for looking for a way out, just for looking for a way out, um, and then you then you're faced with the moodiest of moody trips when you do get out to try and find your way home because the police are making sure that you're taking miles away, like cattle, miles away from any direction that you want to go uh, until they until they're fine to release you. At, a, at a, an incredibly slow place, and then you're just you're, you're there to be left to be picked off by you know criminals who were waiting for you to try and pick you off, either looking for fights, looking to rob you. I know Ian, mm -hmm. you were faced with that. I mean, I was really fortunate. Me, me and Ash were together. 
you face the situation of a long walk mm. on your own. And we were in contact on in our little WhatsApp group, but we were all very, very concerned for you. And I know, you know, you're a better place to talk about that. Yeah, I felt, I think it's one of those experiences, I think, where, and it's easy to say this, I suppose, after the game, because it's full of emotion. And I remember saying something similar after Athens, to be honest, and, you know, ended up going back to, to future football matches. But I don't know whether to go to another one, Neil, another European Cup final. I and mean, that was my fifth one I've been to. Um, and I genuinely don't know whether it'd go again. Um, and I know that's easy to say after the game, but I'm not sure now. I don't think it's a... I mean, that experience was 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 pretty unpleasant. And, and like Stuart, me getting into the ground was, was was fine. I had a bit, a bit of a weird day, to be honest, where I spent most of it on my own because of the, the kind of nature of how I got there. I didn't land in Charles de Gaulle till, till nearly half four. I mean, we were in contact, Neil, but yeah. for me, I had to drop back at a hotel and then it made sense just to go to the ground. And where I was situated in the ground was in a neutral zone, but very Real Madrid end. Um, and I walked in through Gate R with, with, with little or no problems. Um, I had to go and get someone to check my ticket, though, because it was on my phone and it needed to be activated because no one was really checking much. Um, but once I was in the stadium, and I said, I was in there very early, in there by 10 past six. So incredibly early. But it was afterwards where I experienced loads of issues. And I just wanted to get away. And obviously... I'd been in Paris very little time, so getting your bearings, you know, you want to try and do that as much as you possibly can, but it's pitch black now. And I wanted to go a certain way because I'd come in a certain way. Um, and the police were just, I mean, it was a disgrace outside because we were funneled into a very, very dangerous situation where gates were closed and people were just coming and coming and coming because they didn't know, because you expect gates to be open, especially the ones where you've come in. Um, and as you said, the whole purpose after the game is, is to get people out safely and quickly and back to their transport and back to their hotels. This was not happening. Eventually, by gate R, someone, it looked like a FIFA official, opened the gate because it was becoming, and I don't want to make comparisons to, to past incidents, but it, it was becoming a little bit uncomfortable. And then this gate that was opened led to another closed gate. And I don't know how it, it suddenly, it subsided. That that kind of, what felt like a, a bit of a crush was on the horizon. But but for, for whatever reason, it did stop. And we, we then you know, turned around and we went another way. A way that just led us into more and more fans. Um, there was an incident for me where someone was trying to kind of pickpocket me, but all the Liverpool fans put me on to it. There's just someone in between loads and loads of people trying to do yeah. that. But then where I ended up was miles away from where I needed to be. And again, on my own and stuff. I was very apparent at this point as I was walking along the dual carriageway that there was no other Liverpool fans really around me. I couldn't see any kind of red or anything like that. But there was loads of gangs of of, of, of local lads. Um, some of them had Real Madrid tops on because maybe they were, they were supporting maybe, I don't know, Benzema or something like that. But they, I don't think they'd been in the stadium because by then, I don't think Real Madrid had even lifted the trophy by this point. Um, but I had a couple of lads, I say, try and get my watch off me. One grabbed me, one tried to take the watch. Needless to say, they were fucked off. But there was there was a, a lot of other incidents like that where you're just by yourself and it just it felt at any moment that you were gonna but you're about to get filled in. Um because there was just groups everywhere shouting stuff at you. I got mauled at one point where people just jumped on me and I was like thinking, what the fuck? and it, it ended up being nothing in the end, but it was just felt incredibly kind of yeah, incredibly kind of scary, I was supposed would be the best way to sum it up. And there was just no police anywhere by this point. There was no one telling you where to go. Um, eventually I get on the metro and find my way back to the hotel. Um, but yeah, it, it, it wasn't the most pleasant ways to finish a, a European Cup final. There is there is what happened before, which has been really, really solidly documented in terms of the fact that people turned up very, very early. It still remains mad to me, by the way, the, accept, the extent to which that's just accepted as being sound. What other events in your life does anyone ever say? Whatever entertainment event does anyone ever say? Get there two hours before. Or if if not, it's on you. Mm, is yeah. absolutely insane. And but it still remains that that's acceptable. Even within the, the confines of that, that was happening. The stuff that's been documented before Gareth around all of that. You know, I, I will. I'll talk briefly about after, and then I'll circle back around. I couldn't believe what it was like after the game. Genuinely couldn't believe what it was like after afterwards. Because and this is what gives a lie to everything. You know, the idea of I think now. It's been established, the idea of fans turning up late, late, that's been dismissed. I'll come back around. Fake tickets. If there was an issue with fake tickets, and I don't for a second believe there was, but if there was an issue with fake tickets, then surely one of the things that if you're policing that event you want to do afterwards is get everyone to disperse. They couldn't have made it harder for you to no. get away from that ground. Like, literally, if people have been trying to keep you in that ground, the, around that, that complex of that ground, they'd have done what they did. I walked down an underpass with Timo, and it was bottlenecking and it was getting narrower and narrower and at the end I saw the rows of, of riot police and I turned to Timo and, and we just looked at each other and went, we're not doing this. So we, we, we got out of there. That's where it appears afterwards a lot of people have been hit with batons and there's been pepper, pepper spray and tear gas. 
and it had above it like the signage, like M- it was one of the few bits of signage I saw. It, it had like a place name on an M4, like go there, go come around here to get near the train station. Was the, the what I took from that signage. And then as I say, walking down into that, I'm walking back up. I was saying to people, you don't want to go down there. You do not no. want to go down there. My antennae were absolutely like right up here. We walked to the you, we, we walked to the Madrid end, and the reason why we walked to the Madrid end, as I said to Tim, I will we'll be safest with the Madrid supporters. That that's contrary to what conventional football logic is. You, you, you're going to yeah. go and go. I will be safest with the Madrid supporters here. Let's let's go walk. We walk the length of the ground all the way around to go to where the Madrid supporters were to try to make our exit around there. And the fact that you the fact that you're thinking like that, the Madrid supporters were the least of my problems. If any of them had even tried to talk to me, I'd have given them a big hug and said, "You're my mate now." <laughs> like let's you know, well done on winning the cup. I'm saying to Timo, this is. It was so upsetting trying to get away. You buy the underpass where you cut in the end where, where we come back up, trying to get back under there. That's bottlenecked again. That's kettled. There's the dual carriageway down the side. Tim says, you might need to climb over that, you know. And I was like, Tim, I'm 41. I don't yeah. want to break my legs, jump But, but Neil, people, people were doing that. People yeah. felt the only way was to climb fences that were probably 20, 30 foot yeah. drop yeah, yeah. just to try and get out of a situation. Yeah. And I, I debated it. I thought, Ian, nah, you not with your fucking knees, lad, honestly. You'd be in a fucking hospital in about an hour yeah. if you start doing stuff like that. So, but people felt that was the only exactly, option. No. Exactly. It, 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 I mean, it feels, listen, this is very subjective and very speculative, but I can only comment on it, how, how you felt when you were there. But when you were faced with, um, even before they'd got out the ground, the fact that they lined up those riot police in front of the Liverpool end. Never known the and then And then penned mm. us in afterwards. It felt like, to be honest... It felt like the, that they were trying to provoke a reaction so yeah. they could fulfil their own narrative. Yeah. And that's the thing that really, yeah. really angered and upset me. Because at that point, then you're pawns in their game. You're pawns in your wafer's game. You're pawns in the police's game. And they're all in it together. When you hear reports about media as well, be getting stopped by police from filming because they've been told by UEFA as well. It, now, again, you, don't, you only comment on reports there, but they were trying to capture the truth of what was going on out there. And the, word, the, 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 the words, the truth, uh, you know, rings... Rings deeply to Liverpool fans, and and you know the amounts of people that I know mm. that that were there who were who were feeling at risk of crush, at risk at risk to their lives. And when you got listen, Ian's been to five European finals there. That was my first. I don't know if I, I'd ever go again if I was lucky enough to go again. And the ex- whole experience, regardless even what went on before and afterwards, felt soulless anyway. But actually to be in that ground then and all you're thinking about is your mates who you don't know where they are or at the other side of the ground. You're searching through your messages, you're trying to contact them, you're getting bits back from what the odd ones or two have been, been gassed and tear gassed and pepper sprayed. You're getting your phones going off the hook, or off your family who are worried for your own worried safety. Sick, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, by the time that match kicked off, I really have couldn't have cared less, and it was just about getting everyone in and getting everyone out safe. The the riot police on eighty eight was was absolutely staggering. It was mind boggling. I'm, I'm still, and that was when I knew we're in for it here, one way or another. Uh, we're in for it, Gareth. The good thing, and I don't mean this to be rude to anyone involved. The good thing is there's. It was really well captured by journalists on yeah. the ground prior, well prior to kickoff, but also a lot of them themselves were caught up in it. And that helped to counter, you know, I was told at the time the speed with which BT went with the authority opinion yeah. early. It's hugely concerning, really. They are the British broadcaster of choice for these events, and they appear to have decided to parrot the UEFA view really early. Well, they, just, they just stood in the ground looking at the screens and, and reading what was on the screens and then talking about that. And it was like, well, where's your man on the ground? Where's your man outside? You know, the the people criticised Sky Sports a lot, but Sky Sports were excellent on it. Yeah. Absolutely um, tremendous. One of the words against them. And, you know, that, there was a big difference there, and, and BT Sport need to look at their coverage um, next time. Because, I mean, one of the things that's so depressing about this is I nearly wrote a tweet earlier on in the day where I said, this should be the time where things really change. But you know what? You mentioned Athens before. I was in Athens. Athens was a disgrace. Athens was a mess. There was tear gas in Athens. There was, you know, a a ground that wasn't suitable for the occasion. All of those things. There was things could have gone wrong a lot worse in Athens as well. And here we are, what, 15, 16 years, whatever it is on, and the same things are still happening. Um, but I always remember, you know, we've had many conversations and written things and all the rest of it about Hillsborough over the years. And one thing we've always said is, you know, if this happened now, if something like this happened now, at least everyone has the phones, at least everyone has a way of videoing it and reporting it and getting it, getting the truth out there from, from minute one. And that's what happened with this. And that's why, that's why it's different. And that's why it should be different. And look, there's been noises from the government. 
Uh, not the Prime Minister, by the way, who's seemingly more bothered about, you know, us being national anthems. But anyway, some ministers have made comments, some ministers have said words, but those words need to be followed up by actions now, because it's an absolute disgrace, this. And it's so grim, I said to you when I seen you today, you know, it's... So grim to me. To st- I, I didn't go, but you know, I, I know loads of people who did. I was worried about them. I was looking in the WhatsApp groups myself and seeing it unfold, and it was grim reading on Twitter when the kickoffs delayed and all the rest of it. And you know, we're shouting at the screen ourselves in the pub, saying, "Well, hang on, why aren't they talking about this? We're we're able to look at Twitter and see the true story, and you." You on BT Sport are just parroting what you wait for to say. And why aren't you challenging it? Why, you know, and there's, there's literally Kelly Cates telling them to fuck off, you know, on Twitter. You yeah. can see that, surely, or some of your production team can do it. So, so what are you doing? Why are you parroting it? And it was grim. But, yeah, it's, um, you know, to see people who've been going to match for years, 40 years plus, and love the Reds and obsessed with the Reds, and it's been their lives, to see them today saying... I'll never go again. I'm not sure what I'm in it for. Why have I paid all this money to be treated that way? And like this instant, you know, deflection, distraction, deception from your wafer, from the police, from the French government, you just can fuck right off this time. No. And and you know what? I hate the way, I hate it the way, you know, people with their prejudice, prejudices, you know, jump on it in the name of tribalism as well. Fuck that shit off. The only way we get change here is if we work together. And when football fans work together, and they have done, by the way, it's not pie in the sky. The reason it's 30 quid when you go away from home is because football fans work together. Football fans can work together on this and say, we're fed up of being treated this way. Paying 400 quid for an official ticket to be treated like scum is not acceptable ever. And certainly not in the society we're in now. And, you know... It's all bollocks as well. Like, you know, are, are, are the people trying to bunk in? Yeah, there are people trying to bunk in. That is the same at any major sport and event. Certainly, Glastonbury. Any, people yeah. trying to bunk in at Glastonbury. Exactly. I was just, you know, I was just going to use the example of Glastonbury. There's two hundred and ten thousand people going to Glastonbury. There are fake tickets. There are people trying to get over the fences. There are people digging holes. I seen a fella come in on a fucking parachute when I was at <laughs> Glastonbury. No word of a fucking lie. Uh, and so. So that shit goes on. And do not be blaming that shit when you fucked it up. Because that shit you knew about, that shit has happened at events before. And that shit isn't why it unfolded the way it did. And, you know, the the French police have got a reputation. And they've got a reputation for a reason. Same with the Spanish police. And being treated this way when you go away from home. Policed on reputation. You know, we, we did stuff about Seville. How long ago was that? That's a few years back now. Yeah, 20, and, you know, autumn of 2017. There you go, 2017. But, you know, Rangers fans will tell you similar stories that we told at the, at that time about how they were treated when they went to Seville the other week. No food, no water, battery packs taken off them uh, so they couldn't charge the phones. The phones then die and they don't have the ticket. Like, Glastonbury has, has, been, has improved its systems over the years and found ways where you can safely get in, watch bands and enjoy a massive event why has your wafer not done the same? Like, and and another one of the many lies is, you know, like, oh, well, why didn't it happen at the Madrid end? Well, it did happen at the Madrid end. They got gassed. They had people coming in robbing them. They had people, you know, grabbing people's mobile phones as they're about to go in and use a digital ticket, taking a picture of it and trying to get in themselves with that. So guess what? Your ticketing system doesn't work. And like, like I read Phil Blundell saying, you know, obviously he had a legitimate ticket. It wouldn't scan. So there's another issue. So there are loads of issues around the stadium. And thirty to 50,000 fake tickets. Show me you're fucking working on that one, please. Have you worked that out? Where's that come from? It's plucked out your arse. And like... Dave Phillips on Twitter has um, done a thing where he's basically said, Here, here's, here's the number of people you can get through a, a turnstile, go and buy you know, the, the guide, here, which is like the sport and safety group in terms of how many people you're expected to be able to get through a turnstile. It's bollocks. And we know it's bollocks, and it can be debunked and disproven quite easily. So if, if Dave is able to do that on Twitter, someone who works for the government is. Merseyside Police being brilliant, they've come out and said, we've got people on the ground. That's the worst European Cup final we've ever seen, the way it was organised and the way it was policed. There you go. That's not us saying that. That's not, you know, Liverpool fans defending their own and all this shite I've seen online. That's Merseyside Police. Like, you know, I don't know if you will have seen it, and it's just another aspect of the grimness of all of this. Always the victims trended on Twitter. I know. During all this. 
always the fucking victims. Shove it up your arse. Like, these people who have gone to the match with their kids and been tear gassed for no reason, have paid hundreds of pounds to go and have been treated like scum, pushed up against fences, missing games, deciding, you know what, I'll just turn around and go back to my hotel because I've had enough. They are the fucking victims of incompetence in this situation. So why are you using it to score points on the internet, you fucking dickheads? The dickheads and headcases can go fuck themselves. The truth's out there. It's not about establishing the truth anymore. It's about what comes next. Really good statements from Liverpool. Uh, look as though they are prepared to go to the mattresses on this one 100%. And that's brilliant to see. Merseyside Police has been mentioned as well. I spoke to Joanne Anderson yesterday while she was overlooking the parade and she called it police brutality. Uh, did not mince her words. Uh, brutality was the word that well, she used. Well, it is. I mean, some of the stuff out there is so grim. And I might have took a bit more of it in the news. I don't know because, you know, I was at home. But, you know, like, you, you can see... You can see people who are not out to cause trouble, you know, just want to get in the ground, want to drink a water, want to go to the toilet, yeah. basic human rights which were denied in this situation. You, you know, the, the, the lad who's just going through a turnstile and he's obviously not, he's not a scally, he's not violent, he's not frowning, he's not, it, there's nothing, there's no hint of aggression about him. And it, you've got, a, you've got a, a riot police fella walking up and spraying him in the face. For what? What are you doing? Who are you? And why are you still employed? That's, like, sack that person. Yeah, yeah, that is on CCTV. Yeah, yeah. But that's, the, 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 that, that, is on, that is on the internet right now. Identify that person. Fucking sack them. Put them in jail. It's assault. Well, but that's, that's, that's why the stuff after the ground is for me. There's loads before, and it's really well documented, and I'm pleased it's so well documented. But the stuff after the ground just tells you what that was all about. And that was it was it was institutionalized brutality yeah. towards a set of football supporters because nothing else makes sense. Let us get just let it. I don't want to be here. It's been shit. We made to all had a fucking nightmare. I'm hearing terrible stories. People are coming up, stood next to me, absolutely done in. I hasten to add, we're just trying to focus on a football match because they don't want to talk about it right now, which is perfectly reasonable. We've got beat. I just want to get away from this ground, please. Why can't I get away from this ground? Why can't I just walk down those stairs yeah. and walk out of this ground? Oh. This is why. This is why. Because you're trying to force people back into another location to have another go at them. And also, you're there to protect people. That is meant to be the job of the police in any fucking country. So why are these gangs allowed to run riot, you know, knocking people over, dropping tickets, phones, wallets, passports? I've heard it all. And, like, and, and, you know, really sad to hear that you were caught up in it also as well. Like, well, where, well, where are the police there? Because they're... The Athletic has done a huge piece of, of, of where they've just interviewed 50-odd people. The club are also, and brilliant, asking for statements from loads of... So the evidence will be there, first-hand evidence from people who've gone, this is how it's unfolded. So your wafer can go and fuck themselves, trying to deflect and distract. It's not happening this time. You're going to have to address it, you're going to have to be honest, and you're going to have to do something different. And what, what's been pleasing for me as well is... That you know, some some of the French media have also challenged this themselves. They're saying it's yeah. a disgrace. They're saying it's an embarrassment. They're hosting the Olympics next year. They're hosting the Rugby World Cup next year, and this is absolutely embarrassing for the country, for the city, for everything. And to have someone you know that at top level government just throwing out lies like that. Well, we unfortunately you picked on the wrong people here. We know how this goes. We, it's all played out before. And we won last time, and we'll fucking win this time. Sadio Mane, then? <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell. Sadio Mane looks like he's on his way. Um, it is likely going to be Bayern. He's been integral to everything good about Liverpool for a long time. It, it actually reminds me, it's interesting, it keeps being buying the link, because it actually reminds me of Thiago coming to us. Mm -hmm. This sort of sense of, one year left on me deal, I feel like I've done everything I could be reasonably asked to do there. I just fancy something different. It doesn't feel like it's any real more than that from the rumours and the noises. It really reminds me of Thiago, but in the opposite direction. Yeah, and I don't think anyone's sitting here thinking, you know, anything bad of Sadio Mane if he wants to go and... <laughs> Try a new challenge. He, he, he's, he's more than entitled to it. He's been phenomenal for this football club. You know, you could argue you know, he's one of the catalysts. Um, argue the most important transitional sign. And the, yeah. we, we, we don't finish in the top four. We signed Sadio Mane. Every season since we've signed Sadio Mane, we've finished in the top four. Absolutely. And, you know, you think back to just how good he was when he first arrives. You know, you think back to that goal against Arsenal. Um, but there's plenty of other moments as well. He's absolutely superb when he first comes to this club and he continues to operate at that level um, for a number of years. And yes, maybe there's been the odd little dip here and there, but that's the nature of being an elite footballer. You will have spells where you're not at your absolute best. 
But over his time at this football club, more often than not, he's been at his absolute best. And his performance is Neil's second half of the season on the back of what would have been a really, probably kind of intense time for him going to the AFCON. And obviously he comes away from that being being the hero. Um, but there was a lot resting on his shoulders that night and he's embraced the the challenge, the stress, everything that would have gone around that. Um, and he's come back and he's thrown himself into, you know, the next set of fixtures like a man possessed. And he's been absolutely nothing short of brilliant in the majority of games. You know, look at his goal record, look at his goal involvement since then. Um, look at the fact that he's playing in a different position. And again, he's this footballer who has just been able to be moved about and not let his levels drop. How many footballers are knocking about and you can move them from right to left to through the centre and still get the same output? If not, even more. Na- name me footballers who are capable of being able to do that. There aren't many of them at all, yet Sergio Mari's embraced that challenge. As he complained, as he fuck, he's got on with it and delivered and delivered and delivered. And if he leaves the club, which it sounds like he might do, it's an incredibly sad day because he's been one of the integral parts of Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool. He's helped deliver all of those fucking trophies. Um, I wish him all the best because that's what he deserves. And if it is buying fair play, they get one hell of a footballer. There's only 13 Liverpool players in the history of the club who scored more goals for Liverpool than yeah, Sadio Mane. 14 top goal scorer, more than St John, more than John Barnes, more than Kevin Keegan, more than Toshak, Suarez, Torres, McDermott. And he deserves to be remembered in that company for me. Um, he's been absolutely brilliant. I love the fight in him. I love I love the battle in him. I love the attitude on him. Um, you know, again, perfect. you were talking before about how the clubs run identifying him and what he had in his locker. You, you remember when we signed him as well, people said, oh, he's a bit streaky. Ha! He's a bit streaky with his goal scoring. Well, four out of the six seasons he's been here, he scored more than 20 goals. Uh, there was the thing with Kuma, wasn't there, I think, where he was uh, late for training or something as well. So people said, oh, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not the right mindset. Jesus Christ. He's had the best man, <laughs> one of the best mindsets I've ever seen of a football player, hardly ever being injured. Um, and, and as you've already said, they've been absolutely key, both to the transition, but to big successes as well. Scored in big moments, scored a lot against Manchester City, I think, um, which we all love. Um, scored against Bayern Munich, which might have been when they went, fuck, maybe we should sign this fella. Scored against Everton. Scored against Everton, of course, mate. Yeah, how could I forget it? Those um, ones count double. Um, <laughs> and look, it's one of those situations now, isn't it, where it does look like he's going, and that is sad. Um, but equally... I think you've got to sort of say to him, well, if this is what you want, make fair play. And, and and Liverpool, it's going to be difficult for Liverpool to manage this now because there's the thing where you want to take the emotion out of it and just say, well, not bothered. Like, we want the best money for you. And if we don't get the best money for you, you stay because you'll still be an asset to us. But then there's the thing about being sound. And, you know, there's the thing about how Klopp has generally treated his players. And you don't want to create a situation where it becomes beef. You don't want to create one where it's like, hang on, I've done all this for you and I want to go now and you've bought other players that are going to challenge me in my position and I just fancy a new challenge now and it's right for me and it's right for my family and blah, blah, blah. So it's difficult, this. It's going to be difficult for Liverpool. And we've already heard that there is a distance between what Bayern Munich want to pay and what Liverpool want to receive and hopefully that doesn't become beef and we don't make a player stay against his will. Um, I can imagine Sadio with a cob on and I don't want Sadio with a cob on at the club. Uh, so I, I hope we can sort of, I hope we can find a way for this to work. It does seem the way he's talked, and we're still waiting for him to say something else sort of thing, aren't we? Because uh, he said he would and he yeah. hasn't. And then there were some quotes, which I'm not sure whether they're from him or not because they're on the internet. It sort of sounds like he's signing off, but it, it, it might have been misinterpreted. I actually thought when he said what he said, he was saying he was signing a new oh, special deal. news. I was thinking, yeah. oh, yeah, get in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know, I had to find special news in this instance, Sadio. <laughs> yeah. And then now it's like, you know, all, all the trusted reporters and all that say that, you know, the news from inside is that he wants to go. Um, and it is sad. And, and look, you know, you, you always do that thing, don't you, where you say, I'm not going to, be- I'm a grown man now. I'm not going to become attached to a player again, not after Torres. And here we are again. I'm, a, I'm feeling a, a little bit sad about about a fella that's done loads for our club. Maybe got I'm, a, I'm attached to all of these, uh, Stu. 
It's it's hard really to actually um, to follow what Ian and Gareth have said there because they've they've, they've nailed it. Um, I mean, the, the the one one additional thing really that springs to mind is um, he's a maverick. You know, and, and and we love players like that. We love players who show a bit of defiance, have got a bit of fight in them. That you know, when you, when you align that with, the, you know, the skill, and the work rate that he's got. By the way, I mean, we focus a huge amount on, on the, a huge amount on the goals that he scored and his his attacking threat, but it shouldn't be forgotten that that partnership that he's had for for years now with Andy Robbo and even Jeannie when Alden when the when he was in there that little triangle down that left hand side was unbelievable. It was mm. unbelievable. The understanding, the work rate, the cover that they would provide for each other. You know, Liverpool's left side was as strong as uh, as I'd ever seen it. I think, I think there's, I think it's fair to say that um, he struggled a little bit over the the last. Uh, 18 months when he was on that left hand side his, his his form hadn't been quite what it was but then he you know he was rejuvenated again we had a renaissance of him in a centre forward position um, where actually all his natural attributes were able to come to the fore that strength that weird wriggliness that he's got that low centre of gravity um, we're all, we're all um, there again for, for everyone to see and look like you know we've Liverpool have had one of the greatest most deadly strikers in Europe again over the over the last few months. Um, it's it's going to be incredibly sad, but I think that we're going to. I I think you know in response to what Gareth said about um, not dragging this out and 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 coming to a, an understanding. I, I think Liverpool will. I think over the next month that they will. I think it'll happen before pre season. Um, and I think Liverpool now will be doing everything they can to try and secure the next stage in this team and the, uh, and the next attack and force. OK, uh, all the news from the weekend uh, on post-match pint. Gareth confirmed uh, he will be leaving the Anfield wrap at the end of June. All feels very dramatic, like it's a 1st of July uh, thing uh, around around this sort of stuff, Gareth. Uh, but as you said, on post-match pint, you know, it's all things must change, all things must pass at some point. I mean, I know how much how much I'm going to miss you, but go on. Yeah, um, can't believe I'm going to get upset three times in one show. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was hard enough doing this on post match pints, so can't believe we're going to do it again. But yeah, it's it, it's not something I'm doing lightly. It's something I've thought a long time about. Um, I want to retain some kind of a, a association with the Anfield app, yeah. and we've already talked about that myself and Neil. And so it's sort of like I am going, and I won't work here full time anymore, and I won't be involved in the running of it and I won't you know have shares in the company and all that kind of thing but I'd still like to think at a future point I can come back onto shows and that is that is what the plan is sort of behind the scenes so it, I certainly won't be involved in anywhere near what I have been um, in terms of hosting shows and, and all the rest of it and as I said on the post-match point really I, I just want to sort of say a massive thanks to everyone who's out there who, who's listened to all the shows who's watched all the videos who's you know, read the pieces that we've written for the website, who's, you know, just turned what was just an idea, a, th- a throwaway chat with me and Andy in, in the pub a long, long time ago where we said, there's nothing really out there that sort of chimes with us and how we're consuming football and, and, and our story of it. And, you know, we, we were very pissed off with how Hicks and Gillette was reported at times by various media outlets. And we were like, well, imagine we had our own. Imagine we had something regular. But it's got to be real, it's got to be authentic, it's got to be recorded in the right way. Hang on, we might be on to something here. And, uh, <laughs> off, off we went from there, really. I mean, you know, going back to then, Andy was doing some stuff for local radio. Um, I was doing a fanzine, but I'd done some podcasts which, which were not great over the internet uh, back in the day when the internet was 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 bad. Um, and yeah, but we, so this is where we were like, well, it needs to be in a studio. Let's get people together. Let's see how it goes. And I think we'd all say, and maybe we'll do something where we talk at length about this. But we will. You know, we we've all been surprised, including me, where it's gone, the size of it, how it's grew, the community that's around it. But also, I'm very grateful for all of that. And you know, over the weekend and and still now, things are popping up. Um, I've had hundreds of messages, honestly, and and I've been overwhelmed and. I've had a good few cries, it's fair to say. Um, You might have to stop this in a minute, Neil. (laughs) It's all right, I'm in the same boat, don't you worry at all. Uh, That is the... the, There'll be more on this as we go through June and certainly towards the end of June. I've got lots of little bits that I want us to do 
me and Gareth are going to get in a room and have a great big chat for an hour, which I'm both really looking forward to and hugely concerned because, you know, for the pair of us to quote Emma Johnson, our bladders are very close to our eyes <laughs> uh, and we can find ourselves in certain situations. But no, this is... I'll end it now, I'll end it now. This is, you know, there's a lot going on, obviously, at the minute this weekend. But as Gareth says, this has been a, a series of conversations that have been had for a period of time. Gareth's working, worked in fan media for 15 years. 15 years he's been doing fan media. He was fucking great today, wasn't he? That's the Anfield rap.